Hello. Um, oh, God, it's loud. Thank you so much for coming. I really wasn't sure if anyone would come. So this is already really pleasant. Today I'm going to be talking about cultural complicity. It's everyone's problem, uh, which, is, which is fun, obviously. But the first thing I want to talk about is basically a lot of the time when this, whenever you start talking about cultural politics, people kind of sigh and roll their eyes. And I think it's really important just to, I'm sure lots of people here might know this, but lots of people you talk to don't. It doesn't have to feel like work, you know? I mean, but it is work. Uh, <laughs> but as with any work, if you are passionate about it and you embrace the responsibility, it can actually feel quite empowering rather than annoying. So that's cool. Also though, even if you're not bothered about that stuff, it's really worth thinking about these things just for two key reasons. Communities are reflective of tone. And if you are putting out something of a certain tone, the people who are consuming what you're doing are gonna reflect it right back at you. So it will make your life better in the long run. And also, even if you don't care about any of that stuff, it's just the way the wind is blowing. We are kind of moving towards a culture where people making a quick buck is no longer cool or accepted by a lot of younger people. And it is just a good idea to embrace things like honesty and responsibility and think about things more carefully if you just care about making money in the future, which is the most boring reason to care about these things, but it's still legit. First of all though, who am I? Um, I'm Matt, and basically I try and have serious conversations about things and make people think uh, by pretending to be stupid and making silly jokes. And that's basically what I do. I do it on two websites mainly. A website about board games called Shut Up and Sit Down and a website about video games called Cool Ghosts. And most of the time it's about just exploring the nature of play and what play is about and how it makes us feel. But again, we just wrap it up with jokes so nobody notices that. It's, uh, it's devious. First of all though, just before I start this talk properly, bear with me, it's a picture of a bear. I'm sorry I didn't bring an owl today, by the way. I was the only person in the manual for the, today that had a, an owl in the picture. I don't actually have an owl. This talk is gonna be a little bit of a roller coaster initially. I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different things, but then hopefully as we go on, you're gonna see how it all connects. But just so you don't find yourself watching it and going, where is he, where's, you know, bear with me. So a really quick, brief look at Western culture and video games in 2017, just generally where we are. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there've been some increasing cultural conflicts in the Western world. I don't know if anyone's, anyone noticed any of that at all? No, no, oh, fine. Well, we've had, you know, in, in the UK, we've had Brexit, which is obviously the, the, the coolest and smartest thing that my country's ever done for a while. Um, and obviously in the West, you know, further on we have Trump, we have a lot of stuff. We have a lot of irrational thinking coming back into the fray. Uh, we're living in interesting times, as they say. But also I think in terms of video games, you know, video games are playing an increasingly bigger part in the fabric of our culture. And usually this is something that people talk about and they just go, isn't it great? Video games make more money than movies. Video games make more money than everything. Aren't video games great? Please love video games. When actually maybe, rather than us desperately trying to convince the world that we're all right, we should be going, what are we actually contributing to the world now as we're taking over a bigger chunk of it? Like, and thinking about that more carefully. And I'm sorry, but a lot of this stuff, that I know there's some other talks this afternoon about how games can make the world better. And that's all well and good, but it does require work. It's not good enough now for us as an industry to just keep patting ourselves on the back and pretending that we're gonna fix the world because we might help to do that, but it's gonna require a little bit more work than we're currently putting in. Anyway, basically loads of people are playing games and the world is kind of going into a wonky phase. So, I think the interesting thing to look at is what we can learn from the games that people play the most right now in terms of determining what games are and what their role are. And mostly these are games that don't have a clearly defined end and they're games that often infinite playtime. Maybe they're just really long or maybe they're just little games you can play again and again and again. Now this is often framed as being just to do with value, of being like, you know, it's good value for money, especially if it's free. But I think there's more to it than that. I think basically games are just about distraction, really, to be brutal about it at the moment. Games are about filling our lives. Um, and I think this is one of the few times where the distinction of casual and hardcore is not bad. Mostly it's just rubbish and should just be put in a box. But here, it's not about what kind of games you play, it's about the type of gap you're looking to fill in your life. Most people, I think, it's just Grout or Ein Pressmortel in Germany. I hope I said that vaguely okay, because Grout didn't translate as easy as cement, cement. But it's just about like the size of a gap you're looking to fill in your life. Grout comes in many flavors, though. Um, don't eat grout. <laughs> um, and one of the things I think is really interesting now is the fact that I don't really think there's a meaningful difference between mobile phone games and social media. I think they're both just things that engage us temporarily and allow us to 
feel like something's happening while we're on our way to work or waiting for lunch or maybe you were waiting before this talk started and you just thought I'll do something on my phone. We've got into this weird habit and I mean there's some interesting stuff going on like Binky here is an app which is basically was a joke and it's a social media app that you can download if you've got an iPhone or an iPad that it does nothing. It just gives you pictures of stuff like leaves or a hippo and you can tap on it and you like it and you can write comments that no one will ever read. It's completely disconnected from anything. And yet what the person who made it found was it was just as engaging and satisfying as going on Facebook. And loads of people love it. And so at that point you've really got a question like, what are we actually doing when we're like on Facebook or Twitter? Are we actually like keeping in touch with friends or keeping in touch with news? Or is it just a feedback loop? And you know, I worked on a TV show a few years ago with Charlie Brooker, who now does like really cool things. I'm not involved in it at all, and that's fine. But I did a TV show about video games with him. And one of the things we talked about when we were trying to think about the video games that were most influential in history, the one he demanded was at number one. He was a big boss man, so there was no arguing anyway. But he demanded number one be Twitter. And it was something that even when we were in the meeting rooms, I was like, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, Twitter's not really a video game. And when it came out on the TV in the UK, a lot of people were really annoyed. They were like, Twitter is not a video game. You cannot say Twitter is one of the most influential video games in the world. Urgh, it's Mario or, you know, whatever. But now I agree. It's taken me four years, but I completely agree. Twitter is one of the most addictive and least good games in the world. Um, but let's talk about Grout a little bit more. So I think that we have this weird compulsion to fill every moment of our lives now with stuff. And I think where this comes from is kind of complicated. I don't think it's necessarily to say that like, obviously you have to accept the fact that these things are really addictive. Like mobile phone games and social media things are designed to create feedback loops that are addictive. But I also kind of wonder if there's this kind of broader stress, this, this humming underlying underneath society at the moment, um, where people kind of don't just feel a bit more comfortable just doing something on their phone whenever nothing else is happening. And I mean, I think it's an interesting how lots of people talk about young people missing out on a life. You know, oh, you're on your phone all the time. Why aren't you looking at the world? When actually, maybe they're just reasonably reacting to a culture that shows no interest or sign that it's going to reward them long term for any serious <laughs> long term efforts. You know, in that scenario, why not just go for the quick hit? And I think when you look at games that like fill a bigger gap for people, this is where sometimes we see traditionally a lot more problems. Um, there's increased demands on the medium in terms of like what people want from them and for a long time the, the ultimate idea of a video game, the ultimate, and that's part of what you're selling, you're not just selling a product, you're selling an idea, is an idea of a game you can play infinitely, the ultimate game that you can just play forever and it will always be fun. And when games seem to promise this and then fail to achieve that, that's when the biggest backlash comes. You know, No Man's Sky was a game which like lots of people for lots of reasons got very heavy expectations about it. And people were so angry when it didn't meet this ultimate impossible goal. And I think it's really telling here though with when cement doesn't fill the gap that people think it will, the anger tends to stem from consumer rights um, and about treating games as a product. And they talk about it as a product of entertainment, but I think actually it is a, con you know, big games like this are consumable products. They're just not that. They serve quite a specific role. And I think the games are a product. They are basically medication for the soul. And it's soul, it's self-medication though, which is interesting. But this isn't inherently negative. And I think that's the really key thing. It's easy to be like, oh, you know, people are distracting themselves and their problem with games. What's wrong with that? Like, you know, I went through a period a couple of years ago where I was having a really bad time for bad things happening. And I played a lot of Destiny, like a lot, for months. And it was great. And you know, it's, games are a wonderful tool of distraction for people when they're in a period of their life where they're really in need of that. But, and this is a crucial thing, but if you are immersed in something over a really long time and it's an all-consuming monoculture and it's only giving you certain messages and it's only giving you certain ideas, that has very real and really positive consequences. So it's okay for a while, but the longer you're doing it, the more likely you're gonna start having some issues. I mean, this is the point where you have to get a bit like, where does reality even come from? Like, this is some sort of Opti project which is to do with mapping out internet networks back in the early days, it just looked quite nice. Um, psychological research into social norms, into understanding how society works, how we work. A lot of this was done back in you know, the 60s, 70s or earlier. And 
it was just, it cannot even account for modern technology, like the internet. Like, the internet was not built to be a place where people live. It's kind of like a ghetto in a weird way, because like, it's not the fault of the people who design things like comment sections, but no one ever really thought that people were gonna live there. And now we do, and it's awful. So I think technology is changing so fast that it's impossible for psychology to even keep up with these things. And in a few years time, we're probably gonna look back on this period of history and go, what were we thinking? So, on to, this is what I mean, the roller coaster. Talked about games a bit. Now I'm gonna talk very briefly about what happened in 2014. I uh, was invited here today because I wrote a big thing about Gamergate and the connections between that and the alt-right and the kind of uh, fascist movements in the US and beyond. Effectively, I'm not gonna go into any detail on this because um, the people who are victims of this deserve to be able to live their lives and have successes without being defined as victims all the time. The people who were the aggressors and the abusers, they just want attention, so screw it. The why thing that's important about this is it started off with a man har harassing a woman on the internet. It was, there were claims of impropriety. They were just unbelievably debunked very quickly. We're talking like two, three days. Like, nah, this is false, boom, boom, boom. But then it carried on. We had lots of far right people, lots of opportunists just looking to get more influence. Um, and it was kind of dismissed internally and externally. And then, oh no, about a year later, we suddenly saw sort of all this madness that didn't seem to make any sense started appearing in the wider world on a more prominent level. However, a really important caveat that I have to make, because every time I talk about this stuff, people go Brrr. It didn't, like, Gamergate didn't cause the alt-right. It didn't cause fascism in America, all right? Like, there were the, like, America has had some really kind of horrible tendencies in that regard for a long time, and it was very much just one of the bigger tips of the iceberg in culture of being like, we've got a big problem bubbling away here, and it was just one of the first points where we saw it. Having said that, there really were some very strong connections, as I wrote in the article, and uh, you can give it a read if you want, but you know, there's, Gamergate was largely fueled by a website called Breitbart, which was uh, run by Steve Bannon, who then was a big part in the kind of growing the alt-right and gaining a lot of people under this banner, including Gamergate and other people, which then of course ended up basically being literally in the White House, and he only got kicked out this week. And even then, I think the damage is kind of already done. So, we had this movement that was internally within the games industry, sidelined. We've got a horrible tendency in the games industry that whenever anyone calls out for respect or uh, things to be better, it's treated as being drama, like it's a playground, and that's really disappointing. And externally, outside of games, it was just ignored because basically it just confirmed what everyone always thought about video games anyway. You know, it's just a bunch of toxic losers who live in their basement. Like, of course they're being assholes, whatever, like... <laughs> So yeah, we had this aggressive, irrational movement that was fueled by anti-progressive ideals and open bigotry. Like, it must be video games, right? It must be caused by video games because what else could it possibly be? But oh no, it's fascism. Um, so, I mean, one of the things I, I, I spent a long time thinking about Game Game because it didn't make sense to me. It was so irrational. It, it, you, it just, it, I'd never witnessed anything like it. I spent a long time trying to unravel it until I started reading about fascism. And I should have read about it earlier. I should have been taught about it earlier, but you know, we, a lot of countries haven't been. Germany is good at that, it's awesome. But I wasn't. And it wasn't until I read about you know, Ico and Berto's 14 most common features of uh, laying the groundwork for fascism that it was like, oh my, this is why it doesn't make sense because it is, irrationality is at the heart of it. And there were the crossover, was incredible. I think one interesting thing that has shifted since he wrote these things was a key tenet of it in the back in the day used to be nationalism, this idea of people being bonded by where they live. With the internet, you don't need that anymore. You can bond together with groups of people anywhere in the world, which is why, unfortunately, we're seeing things bubble up a little bit more easily because it used to be that you need a certain quantity of people in one place feeling that way to get any real anything off the ground, whereas now you can have pockets of people all over the world forming groups that appear bigger than they are. Anyway, all this stuff is kind of irrelevant. I'm just going through it over backstory so we get an idea of what's wrong and what we need to look at. The key thing for me is that games culture proved to be a really soft target for far-right recruitment. I think that is the key thing. I mean, to look at why that is and look to change that. Because we didn't start the fire, as Billy Joel said in a song, but we did ignore quite a lot of petrol. That bit wasn't in the song. Just because games weren't responsible for the anti-progressive movements we've seen across the world, it doesn't mean that we aren't culturally complicit. You know, this happened in our house, and that has been what has been most upsetting to people like me who've lived, lived and worked in games for 10 years. It's something that happened where we lived. And to ignore it and to push it one side and go, yeah, but it wasn't me, it wasn't people like me, that's irresponsible. We need to take responsibility for what happened and try and stop it from happening again. 
Is it just cultural backlash, is what some people say. This is an argument. Yeah, but maybe it's just because there's been too much progression and things are getting too different and people are just angry. This doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, I'm just gonna, no. Games being made for men and always being made for men is a false status quo. It wasn't true in the 80s and ever since it's been a kind of half-truth through the marketing, but mainly it's just bullshit. And also things haven't actually changed that much. Like this idea that games landscape has changed so much that people of course are angry and standing up against it. No, most games are still just made for young men. It's, it's nonsense. Also, the key thing about this argument is it allows people to frame their aggressions and anger as a necessary response to something else rather than unprovoked aggression. And again, this is exactly what we're seeing at the moment with the far right. So this argument, put it in the bin. Still though, I kind of wonder about this, and I think, is the content of games today a problem? And I think violence, people talk about violence, I don't think that's a problem, but I think violence without context is, is, is an issue. And it's not so much the violence, it's more the aggression. If you're not giving people good reasons to be fighting stuff and killing stuff, then you can maybe very gently kind of change the norms that people have in their heads about what's right and what's wrong. And I think the most worrying tendencies for me at the moment is a tendency for games not to say anything. We've got a trend at the moment where marketing for games is using political issues and touchstones as buzzword like marketing lip service where you'd be like, yeah, it's maybe about this, but then the game comes out and it's like, no, we're not actually saying anything and it's complex and nothing's black and white. And then we've got this, also this insistence that games aren't political. Like, you know, Far Cry 5 is a, is a game which is coming out soon and it's about far right religious fundamentalists in America, but the devs are still like, no, it's not, it's not we're not making any political statement. It's like, well, why not? Like, why not? Um, and I think this combined with a trend in game design towards grey morality is just the thing of, amplifies a culture of false equivalence, you know? This idea that like, I mean, it does it in games, I get why it does it, it does it for drama. It's like, because it means that everything's exciting and bad things are always happening and oh, heartstrings. But in reality, it does help build this political culture where people think, yeah, but everything's probably equally bad, isn't it? Which is a real issue in culture at the moment. So games should maybe stop doing this. And this isn't just game dev. This is a problem that's part of an ecosystem supported by all of us. And that includes dev, you know, promotions, community, marketing, advertising, press. You know, I've seen so many media talking about Far Cry 5 and about how it's like, oh, isn't it really interesting that they're, they're talking about like American far right fascism. It's like, well, it might be, or the game might not do that. So let's not giving them, you know, games that haven't proven themselves to be doing it. And if the devs say they're not doing it, then stop giving them free lip service. Like proof is in the pudding. So what do we do though to make things better? And this is where it gets a bit tricky because I think this is a hard thing, especially for me. We need to radically accept what games are right now in the world, what they do. And this is difficult for me because I know that games can do so much. I know that games can teach us. They can challenge us personally. They can encourage personal growth. I'm somebody who grew up banging on in parties at two in the morning to strangers about Shadow of the Colossus. And, ah, oh, but it makes you feel all these, oh, and, you know. So for me to accept that actually this is not currently what games are, is hard, but we need to. We can aspire towards what games can be whilst also accepting the role they currently play in society. And this is crucial for making positive changes. And I mean, when you look at what games are, one of the key symbols here is to look at how the world treats games and what the world thinks games are, because I think that's actually quite representative. And games to the world are gamification and using gaming tools where, I mean, this is an image I found on LinkedIn, and it's just a sort of meaningless nonsense that is, is, is filled, the world is filled with. But the core idea of gamification is basically just feedback loops, equal engagement, equal fun. This word engagement, this idea that like fun is a result of, well, it's keeping you busy, isn't it? It's like keeping you looking at something, you must be having fun. And it's, I mean, that's nonsense, but also it's the dark truth of what games currently are for a lot of people. I mean, should we just be playing games less though, you know? We live in an increasingly anxious, unstable culture. Many games are increasingly designed just to distract us from our lives. You know, we should be kissing trees. We should switch off our devices and we should all go on a nice walk. This is nonsense as well. This is the sort of thing that people say when they're in a position where they can just switch off things and go for a nice walk. It's a pretty privileged thing to think. The truth is, the world is not in a good place right now, right? Lots of people are having a really bad time. And we can't just be like, hey, why don't you take up yoga? Like, no. Uh, <laughs> The truth is, disenfranchised people have always found solace in games. This is not a new thing. We are in a complex economic depression. It's not good. Automation is shifting more and more people away from work. That's not necessarily a bad thing long term, but we're in a weird teething process. And while we're working this stuff out, until we adapt, more and more people are going to be turning to games to fill a gap in their lives that society hasn't worked out what we're going to do with yet. And I'm sure we will get through it, but we're not going to get through it for a while. And so the question for me is, 
how are the games that people play over the next 10, 15 years while they're waiting for society to give them something, anything to do, how, how are these games going to affect these people? How is it going to change their identities subtly over time? I think the key thing that we need to keep in mind what, when what we think about what games are is games are a place where disenfranchised people live. Like, this is just key. And if you don't start treating games as being like, like, like places where people are going to exist, then you're maybe not making a game properly at the moment. And we know that this is where, we know this. The thing is, like, this isn't a new conversation. Like, we should, we should have already been thinking about this, because for years, marketing has been aiming at disenfranchised young men for such a long time, and this has led to insecure individuals being whipped up into communities by slightly thoughtless games publishers being like, be the best, come on, and then these communities have formed angry mobs, and let's not do this again, please. Uh, a side note, actually, if everyone's watching, if you're still pandering to power fantasies in 2017 and still insisting that the customer is always right, etc., do not be surprised to discover that your community is just people with fire and torches trying to burn you. It's just, we've seen where this leads. You can have honest conversations with people, but this empowerment and this pandering is a dark path. Stop it, because you're going to get burnt. Anyway, something crucial I need to say about disenfranchisement, because it's a word I've been using a lot. It's a factor, it's not an excuse. And I think the key thing when you look at things like Gamergate is this is a movement of cynics and losers. Like, that's it. There's nothing more to say about it, really. You've got opportunists swooping in to get some extra influence or some extra money, or you've just got people who failed to find a place in society. And that's sad, but at the end of the day, these people chose hate and bigotry because they couldn't find a place in society. Once you've made that choice, you don't get any sympathy, you just become a bullet point in a presentation about disenfranchisement. Like, that's it. And what happens next is different. Like the scale of disenfranchisement we're gonna see over the next 10, 20 years is gonna be so much bigger than this small bubble of, of men who didn't really find what they wanted in life. And for most people, it's not gonna be their fault as well. So I think a key thing here is we need to be proactive about this, not reactive. We need to kind of forget about Gamergate in a way. We need to remember it and be like, that was awful, God. But also, like, don't try and deal with these people. Don't try and change these people. These people have already built houses out of concrete. They're done. They're like, we kind of need to forget about them and be reactive and look at the future. Because I think this doesn't need to be about damage limitation. If we look at what happened in 2014 and look at the 10, 15 years of games and marketing that led up to that moment, we can now look at what we can do in the future and actually make a positive change, have things being good rather than less bad. But to do that, we need to kind of basically put all this stuff to one side and start again afresh with these learnings. We see what happens when you wean the disenfranchised and fantasies of power, aggression, and control. It's bad, let's stop. Other fantasies are available, you know? Some of the trends that we see the next generation latching onto are really interesting. Things like Minecraft, collaboration, growth, people working together, trust as well. This idea that you're gonna let someone come and do something with you and trust they're not gonna destroy all your stuff. Undertale, a, a game that was just like, came out of nowhere and kids loved it. And it was just about love and friendship. And it was really, really sweet. Dream Daddies, just, it's like d dating dads. And you know, again, that was something that was heavily supported by internet celebrities who kind of made that a thing. You know, it wasn't like it came out of nowhere just because people love gay dads. That would have been wonderful. It's not the whole truth. But people are still more open to embracing this stuff. And Overwatch, just hugely diverse, unashamedly so. And it is filling a gap. This is the crucial thing. Like for a long time, disenfranchised young men were the, the only disenfranchised audience. But you know now, there's a lot of disenfranchised people out there. Do, do a different fantasy, do something positive. And you know what? I think a key thing here is that controversial is good. I think if you're doing something controversial in games right now, in mainstream games, any decision that is controversial just means different. It just means it's not exactly what's come before it. So if you're not doing something vaguely controversial, you're probably not doing anything interesting. I mean, even in like the most recent Zelda thing, which I did a big video on recently, had some odd stuff to do with this idea of impermanence and this idea of trying to encourage players to live in the moment, not to hoard things, not to collect, not to kind of have traditional capitalist kind of inspirations. And that has been done in a few games. A lots of games trying to encourage players not to hoard things and people really don't like it. But it's because it doesn't fit the status quo of like our generation and those above it. Next generation, we can do what we want. <laughs> it's like we don't need to follow these old things. And this is a key thing here as well. It's like Brenda Romero always says, the mechanic is the message. It's not about making games that are like, hey, let's fill our games with gay dads. Hey, let's, 
let's make games that shows that racism is bad. You can just by having mechanics that are different and interesting and not reflections of our current world be making quite radical products that will affect the thinking of a new generation. And you know what? The future does require radical thinking. I love Animal Crossing, but we can't just keep having games in which people can buy a house because it's not realistic. <laughs> and I don't know what the end game of that is, but in the same way when you had a generation of people being told that you can control everything and dominate women and then they couldn't and they got mad, I'm not sure what the long-term effect is of, of everyone playing games where meritocracy is actually a system that works and being like, yeah, it's fine, you work hard and you'll do well. It's, like, it's not the way the world works and it's gonna have a backlash, but it might just be a bit softer. Anyway, I love Animal Crossing, it's cool. Oh, I've gone too far, how do I go back? One sec. Um, I don't know. Do, do. Look, radical thinking is dif difficult. I know this, right? And I know it's really easy for sort of idiots like me to stand on the stage and go, hey everybody, let's just think radically and change the world. It's like, it's what tech is built on and it's rubbish. Um, but I think a really key thing you can take away from this, uh, which is really simple, is disenfranchisement is not a dead end. Now for some people it is. For some people they just find themselves in a bad place and they never get out of it. And then this is when you have the problems with monoculture, when people just immerse themselves in very similar video games with very similar ideals for 15 years and come out of it kind of with a wrong head of view of what reality is like. But for most people, people just end up being disenfranchised for a while and people come out of the other end of it. But the thing is, the key thing about this is Video games are almost like a house. They're almost like a house that people go into when they're disenfranchised. And some of those people are gonna play a lot of games for a few months or a few years, and then they're gonna get better, and their lives are gonna get better, and they might come away with some of that. But some of these people aren't, and some people are gonna be disenfranchised, and then they're gonna come out of it, and they're gonna end up in worse places. You know, they might end up in hate groups. They might end up being terrorists, you know? And I think the key thing with this is if, if you've got the opportunity, if you had someone coming into your house, and you were like, somebody told you, hey, this guy in like two years, he's gonna be a terrorist but he's gonna be in your house for like two weeks or like two months. Wouldn't you wanna like say something? Wouldn't you wanna like try and be like, hey, I don't know. I just feel like there's this opportunity where video games are a, a, a point in a lot of people who end up being disenfranchised. And if we can try and speak to people in a meaningful way and give them new ideas about the world, then we might actually be able to make people come back out of it easier and not end up going to these really dark places. So I think it's just, it's an opportunity to put a weird word in someone's ear it's a kind of weird thing to think about, but I think it's important. And here's finally just some practical solutions because I, I don't like airy-fairy kind of nonsensical presentations. If you're making a game, uh, examine what behaviors your game is encouraging. I think that's a simple thing. Question the explicit and implicit messages in your game, the things you're directly telling players, but also just things that are being applied about the world. Think about the way that your game encourages interactions with other others, uh, whether that's a multiplayer game or not. And I think this is a key one. Imagine that your game wholly defines someone's viewpoint for the world. Imagine that somebody just plays your game for like 10 years. What would they think about the world based on that? And that seems like really stupid, but I honestly think that this gradual bleed of culture and when games are all very, very similar, I think it's a thing. And if you're selling games, then I think think about the impact of the fantasies that you're selling. I think that if you're reselling the fantasies uh, that have already been sold by society, that are kind of been missold, then that's not a good pattern to get into. You're gonna end up, people will buy them, but people are gonna end up angry and they might come for you. Um, consider who you empower through the nature of your marketing. That's just a really key thing, like, what are you doing? Are you enabling the status quo here or are you empowering different people? Think about that. And also, every bit of media you put out there is a reflection of who and what you stand for. I see a lot of this people being like, yeah, well, you know, we put out this one slightly dodgy Facebook ad, or yeah, well, we, you know, we did this one thing, and yeah, that press release was a bit off. It's like, no, you, you've got to treat it as the whole thing. Like, you know, your community management needs to be tight. Your advertising needs to be tight. You cannot afford just one little bit, because then, as I said earlier, communities are reflective. And once you've got a community, you cannot get rid of it. So just build it carefully. Um, sorry, I seem like I'm really angry right around here, I'm not. <laughs> you seem lovely. Um, finally, embrace complicity and responsibility. Because it's cool, like you can build a cool future. Like a lot of this time people just go, oh, just leave us alone, I just want to make a game. And it's like, look, it's not, it's not that much extra work. All it requires is for you to actually examine everything a bit more carefully and think about how things could be different. And you know what, you'll make better games if you can get your head into the mindset of cultural critical thinking. The things you make are just gonna be better. 
And that'll be cool, so just give it a go. And I mean, finally, this can still be profitable. Lots of the time people like, equate this as being like, oh, if you care about this stuff, you're gonna make a game that no one wants to buy. And it's just not true. And I think some of the games I showed earlier just, just prove that. Like, out of nowhere, we're seeing smash hits that are exactly the sort of game that for years people in marketing have gone, yeah, but no one will buy a game like that. It's like, you're wrong. So update your spreadsheet. And I mean, finally, yeah, something by the fantastic writer Lee Alexander, gamers don't have to be your audience. This is a key thing. And I think this really ties in with what I'm talking about in terms of the disenfranchised groups we have now and the disenfranchised groups we had 10 years ago. Like, I, it's not just young men who want to shoot things. And you know what? In the past year, we've seen a lot of games who've been selling that failing pretty hard. Like Lawbreakers came out, it is bombing. Titanfall 2 came out last year. Admittedly, a bad point, but it bombed. Like all this stuff, which like five years ago was just bread and butter. Like, yeah, do that, print money, easy. It's just not anymore, like it's changed. So just think differently. Do not just go through the same cookie cutter approach because it's not even assured you're gonna make money anymore. So, you know, as I say, open the mind uh, or die. Um, <laughs> finally, a final call to arms. Just try and rediscover play. This is, I, I got really caught up. I started realizing I probably just shouldn't use photographs that I didn't own, so I just started putting my own photographs in. That's me with worse hair. Um, Play is cool, like play is at the heart of games. People bang on about games being about systems and mechanics and engagement and it's nonsense. The heart of games is play and games forget that way too often. Play allows us to play with ourselves, play with roles, change, uh, have a lot of fun. Games are more than loops and distractions. Uh, and I think we've seen this with like the resurgence of board games. You know, I run one of the biggest board game websites in the world and it's just getting bigger and bigger every year. It's, it's awesome. Uh, but it's because people want more from games. They don't want to just sit and collect a thousand uh, gold cats and then level up, that's nonsense. Um, they want more, they want social experiences. Uh, games can and should be about people. And that doesn't matter if it's a multiplayer game or a single player game, games should be about people and how we interact with the world. That is why children play. That is the function of play, is so children can learn to be people. And I think that adults can learn to be people as well. And I think finally, we can and should try and just work towards a future where next time something like this happens, because history is circular and it will happen again, we should try and work towards a future where the people who play games are the first bastion against fascism, rather than like the first people who are like, yeah, let's, let's be fascists. And I think that's like, come on, we could try and do that. It's not, is that so much to ask? It really shouldn't be so much to ask. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, Huh? Like being hit by a British truck. I thought you said a shark. Yeah, or a shark. You can be hit by a shark too. But it's not that easy.